would take your, your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to be there for just a minute, and then we'll spend the rest of the morning in the book of Titus. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 6. 1 Timothy 4, 6. It says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. And look down in verse number 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And then down in verse 16, it says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For doing this, thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning that you have given us a free country. Thank you for those who throughout the years have paid the ultimate price so that we can stand here today and freely worship you. We thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you for those today who defend that right and for those who serve in the military and uh, police forces and those things so that we can have these freedoms. Thank you for the freedom ultimately that comes in Christ. Thank you for his shed blood. Thank you that we can have eternal life through him. We pray this morning that you would bless your word. Teach us from it, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Yesterday we had a doctrinal ordin ordination council here at church where we examined Kevin McCoy and his doctrine and his call. And uh, for about three hours, he answered questions concerning his doctrine and those kind of things. Some people say, well, why do you do that? Well, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is to make sure someone who's going out into ministry actually knows what they're talking about. We don't just put our stamp of approval on folks to go out into ministry because they're good people or because they've been around or even because they want to. None of that has any bearing on it if a person says, I want to be a in the full-time gospel ministry or if I want to be in the gospel ministry, then it's the local church's responsibility to ensure that that person is prepared, and if they're not prepared, then they need to, to get the additional training. So we look at his doctrine and what he says he believed, and of course he had to defend that, and there were some very good questions, and hopefully it's a good time of edification, I think it was, and uh, he did a great job, and we're going to actually uh, ordain him here in just a little while. But uh, the reality is, folks, every person in this room, if you say you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the reality is you should know doctrine. Okay, Understand, in, in our times, doctrine has been made to be a bad word by the new evangelical movement and these people who want to play watered-down church. But all through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're told to know the Word of God. Or it's not a suggestion. It's not a, if you feel like it or if you feel inclined to do it, God's people are told to know his word, and knowing his word, we are to do what? Live by his word. We don't know it, we're not going to be able to live by it. The word doctrine simply means teachings. Sound doctrine are those teachings that are, are correct, they're right according to the word of God, and every believer should be taught and should be able to stand on sound doctrine. You as a believer should know what sound doctrine is. You as a believer should recognize when false teaching that's contrary to sound doctrine is put out. The reality is so many believers simply just don't care. I'm just being honest with you this morning. Many of God's people know things that they're involved in, things that they like, really don't please God. Really, they're even contrary to what Scripture would teach, and yet because we like it, because it appeals to our flesh, because it's what we want to do, we go ahead and do it. The importance of sound doctrine can't be overlooked. It affects every area of our walk with Christ, every area of our walk with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to take some time this morning and just look at just a little bit of that. By the way, if you're interested in, in just a... a, a bird's eye view of the focus that God's word puts on doctrine, read 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus and just underline every time you come across the word doctrine or teachings. Highlight it maybe. And you'll be amazed at how highlighted just those three chapters are. Now you can go back to Jesus and read through the gospels and read the number of times it says that he sought down to or he sat down, he sat down to teach the people. And the people questioned his teachings. And you see the Gospels full of doctrine. The book of Acts isn't necessarily a doctrinal book. A lot of people try to go to the book of Acts and make up things of doctrine. The book of Acts is a history book. 
that tells us about the early church and what the early church did. But even there, we see that they focused on the teaching and preaching of Christ, the doctrines of Christ. You, you know what 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, um, Galatians, Ephippians, uh, Ephippians, Philippians, <laughs> Ephesians, they're all running together. You know what those all are? They're doctrine. They're teachings of how the church in our age should operate and function. When you want to find out how the New Testament believers should operate, those are books you should be saturating yourselves with. And yet, the reality is many of God's people don't. Many of God's people aren't interested. Doctrine is not a bad word. It's a good thing. See, folks, the church has drifted. And God's word has warned us. Second Peter, Peter warns us that there's coming a day where the church will drift away from the truth and that ungodly men will sneak false teaching into the church. Literally, he says they'll bring it in privily, which means they'll sneak it in through the back door, literally, is what he's saying. They're not going to bring it right down front and stand up with a big sign saying, this is false teaching. I am about to teach you something wrong. And then they start teaching false teaching. That's not how they do it. But they've been able to, through the ignorance of God's people, to bring false teaching in. We find in Romans chapter 1 that thing that this has been going on for ages. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, There were people who held the truth in unrighteousness, meaning they knew the truth, but they suppressed the truth. It goes on in Romans chapter 1 verse 25 and says that there are those who change the truth of God into a lie. In other words, God's word clearly taught one thing, but someone came along and said, well, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I don't like that. I'm not comfortable with that. Listen, friend, if you're not comfortable with the word of God, get right with God. Okay, that's the bottom line. Well, I'm not comfortable with the word of God, so we'll change it into something completely opposite. Also in Romans 1.28, it says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So what they wanted to do was play church, but they didn't really want God. They wanted to go through the motions of looking religious to comfort their conscience, soothe their conscience, or whatever it was they were doing. But they didn't really want to be true to what God had to say. For believers in the New Testament age, folks, we need to understand doctrine and the importance of doctrine. I want to show you just a few things. Look, if you would, to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1. We live in a day of religious deception. Don't fool yourself. Don't be deceived. How many times do we read that in Scripture? Be not deceived. There's all types of religious deception in our world today. And, and you've got to come to the point in your mind eventually, hopefully, that anything contrary to God's word is what? Wrong. It's not maybe okay. It's not, well, depending on the context, wrong. If it's contrary to the teaching of God's word. Well, yeah, but I. Well, yeah, but I doesn't matter because God has said. If yeah, but I is different from what God has said, the problem is not with God, but it's with yeah, but I. Okay, does everybody follow that? Titus chapter 1, verse number 9. We see the, the necessity of doctrine to separate truth from experience. Notice Titus chapter 1, verse number 9. It says, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine to ex both exhort and convince gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of them, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that, that, turn, that turn from the truth. We see here, folks, that doctrine is necessary to separate truth from experience. If we go through an experience that's contrary to what God's word says, we need to get away from it. Doctrine is needed. We need that to be grounded. Notice in verse 9, the phrase is here. He says, holding fast the faithful word as you've been taught. Sound doctrine. God's people need to get to the, the point in their lives where they're willing to take every experience and pour it through the filter of God's word. And what doesn't go through that filter is what? Well, let me ask you a question. How many folks here drink coffee? Okay. When you make your coffee and it goes through that filter, 
and you've got your cup and you've got the filter. How many of you take the filter and eat the contents of the filter? Anybody? Why, why don't you do that? Somebody tell me. It's trash. It's not good for you. What else? It's gross. <laughs> it's strange. What do we do with the filter? We throw it away. Now let me ask you another question. How come in the lives of believers, when things will not go through the filter of the word of God, how come believers hang on to that and make excuses for it and say, well, yeah, but you know. Next time you think, yeah, but you know, and you make coffee, grab you a handful of what's in the coffee filter. You don't say, yeah, but you know about that. We throw that stuff away. Folks, listen, what doesn't filter through the, the, the filter of sound doctrine is not needed in the life of a believer. And it really doesn't matter how you feel or what you like. It matters what God says because that's the bottom line of what we'll be judged on. And so doctrine helps us to be grounded. Notice we're warned that there are deceivers coming. Notice verse 10, for there are many, not just a few, many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Now, question, who is the circumcision? That was a religious crowd. And so Paul is telling Titus, listen, the religious crowd is going to be a hotbed of false teaching. And so you better be ready. You better know your doctrine. Because I promise you, the religious crowd knows their doctrine, and they can make it sound very, very spiritual. We need to know doctrine to the point, folks, where we understand in our mind that anything contrary to the word of God is false teaching and not be apologetic about it. Amen. Notice the, the heart's desire of these filthy lucres. First, they're teaching, or these filthy false teachers. Verse 11, they're teaching things which they ought not. That phrase, they're teaching things which they ought not, implies very clearly that they know right from wrong. And there's a certain reason they've chosen to teach false teachings, and it's given here for filthy lucre's sake, so they can make money, or so they can draw a crowd to themselves, or so they can seem popular, or so they can get a title and have people look up to them. We need to know the difference. And many of these people will direct us not to the scriptures, but to the traditions of men. Notice verse 14. Not giving, heed to, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that, notice this, turn from the truth. Commandments of men or the personal preferences, the likes and dislikes that get preached as truth, which turn men from the truth. And by the way, this isn't the first time in Scripture we're warned of doctrines of men. Look real quickly, if you would, back in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Here in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees knew the Old Testament. They knew the Bible, but they had so far removed themselves from the Old Testament that now the Old Testament, the Word of God, meant nothing to them. What was important to them now were their own hedges that they had built around the law to the point they didn't know the law anymore. And so now Jesus warns them, he says in verse number seven, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, the people draws near unto me, or nigh unto me with their mouth, and uh, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me. That word vain means it's empty. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Listen, folks, one of the reasons we need to know sound doctrine is that because there are many people who think their, their likes and their dislikes, their traditions, are on the same level as Bible doctrine. Listen, if you have a certain preference or a certain like or a certain dislike, good for you. But it's not doctrine. Now, if you want to be carnal and immature and get mad because somebody doesn't agree with your like or dislike, then that should just show you you need to start growing and get deeper in the Word of God. Well, I don't think anybody should wear a tie at all. Somebody says, Amen. Okay. 
That's a personal preference. If you do or don't, I don't care because it's not doctrine. But there are people that would fly apart at the idea of not to the point of getting mad, wanting to leave a church and throw a fit. Folks, that's the commandment of men. Those are people who've been deceived somewhere along the lines that their personal likes, their personal preferences are as important as Scripture. Paul warns them about this. He warns them about giving heed to, to Jewish fables and the commandments of men, which notice verse 14 back in Titus chapter 1. Those who get caught up on the commandments of men and their own likes and their own dislikes, notice it doesn't say if you give heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that it will make you more spiritual. It will give you a deeper walk with God. What does it say it will do? Notice what it says. That will turn them from the truth. And so you better know your doctrine. Because if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, this, that, or the other thing, or I don't think, or I think, doesn't matter what I think or you think, what does it matter? What does the scripture say? And so doctrine, first of all, is important for the believer to learn to separate truth from experience or truth from preference, because there's a big difference there. Notice we need to be aware of error. Look down in verse number 15 and 16. He goes on and he says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but ever their mind and conscience is, defi is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny and be an abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Again, the religious crowd is not interested in pleasing God and knowing what God has said about something. The religious crowd is interested in promoting self, personal likes, personal dislikes, above doctrine, again, teaching for commandments, the doctrine of men. And so as believers, we need to know sound doctrine so that we can separate true doctrine from personal preference and personal experience. There's another area that doctrine is important. Look in Titus chapter 2, and this is kind of just a quick overview of doctrine in the book of Titus. Second thing we need to understand is that doctrine is essential in the church for right relationships. And that's what chapter 2 is all about. I'm just going to kind of give you an overview, but notice verse 1. But speak thou things which become sound doctrine. So he starts out with the things out of our mouth based on sound doctrine. Then he says down in verse number 8, or excuse me, verse number 7, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uh, uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Then verse number 10, we're to adorn the doctrine of God. And then he sums it up in verse 15, saying these things, speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise you. And in between, he deals with relationships in the local church. He deals first with the men. Chapter 2, verse 2. They're to speak things which become sound doctrine. They're to be sober, grave, temperate, sound in the faith. Folks, we don't become sound in the faith just by getting old. Okay, does everybody understand that? How do we become sound in the faith? By getting in the word of God, by getting into the doctrines of God, and by learning them and applying them to our lives. That's where becoming sound in the faith. The reality is that there are are younger men who are more mature spiritually than some older men. Just because we've been saved a long time doesn't make us spiritually mature. And so the idea here is that we need to be learning and growing. Hopefully as we get older, we get wiser in the word and we get more grounded in the word. Then he goes and deals with the women, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. And again, just because ladies, as you get older, that doesn't make you holier. But as we get in the word, he goes on, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger women and to teach the younger women specifically to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. That word discreet has the idea of modesty. And ladies, we could use a big dose of that nowadays. Modest, discreet. He goes on here, uh, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Notice that the word of God be not blasphemed. Then he deals with the young men. And so we see that intertwined with all these relationships 
the, the bottom line foundation for all of that is speak thou things which become sound doctrine. Adorn the doctrine of Christ. The, the baseline is the, is, is the word of God. So we as God's people need to understand that to have the right relationships with one another, it's based in the word of God, not based in my opinion, my feelings, or whatever. So the church operates that way. We also see in our relationship to God, verse number 11, our relationship between, um, how did I have this worded here? Man to God. Notice verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. There's that idea of being grounded in doctrine, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, godly. When? When we're in heaven? When? In this present world. And so being grounded in doctrine has an effect in every aspect of our life. It's not just something that preachers do or something we do in an ordination council. Doctrine is for every believer. The teachings of the word of God are necessary for each believer. And as we look one more at one more aspect of this briefly, as we understand our doctrine, it helps us to become effective witnesses. Notice again verse number 8 in chapter 2. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Listen, when we witness to people, folks, we need to know the word of God. We need to understand the doctrines of the word of God because there are going to be a number of people that are going to question, deny, and if we don't know, we can stutter and we can make up silly things to tell them, but we need to know the doctrines of the word of God to be effective in our witness. Look over at chapter 3 just for a minute. Chapter 3, verse 8, he says this, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are, are unprofitable and vain. And so Paul is telling us we need to be able to stay focused, stay sharp on doctrine, because people will try to sidetrack us. Well, yeah, but what about? Well, some of that stuff, the what abouts, aren't as important as let's stay focused on what we're talking about. I said all that to say this, folks, it's important for God's people to know doctrine. It's important for God's people to be continually learning. We, we should never get to the point where we think we've arrived, where we know it all, where we can't learn anymore because this book, God's Word, is an inexhaustible source of truth for us as believers. The worst state that I think I've ever seen a believer in, and I've seen a number of them, they get to the point where they think, you know, I've learned what I'm going to learn, and I know what I know, and that's all I know, and that's all I'm going to learn. That's sad. As believers, we need to continue to grow. And listen, if God's desire for us is Christ's likeness, which I believe the New Testament is very clear in, in teaching us, if we get to the point where we think, okay, I know what I know, and that's all I'm going to know, that process stops. He can't continually conform us unless he's continually working through his word and we're continually learning. And so even though we live in a world where the religious crowd doesn't like doctrine, where many church people are afraid of doctrine, God's word encourages us as believers, all of us, to be sound in doctrine, to know it, to learn it, to communicate it, to understand the teachings of God's word that, that show us how to interact with one another and even show us how to interact with the lost world so that we don't have to try to do it on our own and stumble by on our own, but we can do it through the power of God's word. Let me ask you this morning, would you rather serve in the power of God and his word or in your own efforts? Well, if you've ever tried to serve in your own efforts, you know what a waste of time that is. Get in the word of God. Learn it. Don't be afraid of the word doctrine. Because it just means the teachings. And we need to be taught by the Word of God. We need to be taught by the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Uh, at this time, I want to call Kevin down. And uh, come on down here.